Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to ELE 3204. I hope uh, this morning wasn't too much. Um, we have learned a lot of uh, things in the, in the morning. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of details um, on concepts, um, but it's really important to put things into categories and uh, um, it would uh, help you to simplify um, all, all of those uh, concepts. Um, so first of all, let's uh, recap on fading for the last time um, and we'll move on to modulation. So this would be a good example of uh, how to simplify uh, concepts by putting them into cate uh, different categories. Um, so I have uh, emphasized quite a lot of times that uh, there are, oh, um, okay. Um, so I can show you where it's a uh, lecture recording is. Right. Let me share my screen. Okay, um, so you can see my screen now. Um, in uh, BB Collaborate here, if you click on the uh, left hand side uh, of this, you see recording and uh, all the recording of uh, all the past libraries are here. I used to uh, do pre recording as well. Um, but I delete them after lectures because uh, uh, normally lectures are, yeah, okay. Normally lectures are better. Right, let's go back to slides. Okay, so. Uh, so as, as I said, it would be easier if you if you can uh, kind of when there are too many concepts, it, it would be easier if you can put them into different categories and uh, remember them uh, rationally. Um, so first of all, uh, I have emphasized uh, a lot of times that there are three levels of uh, channel modeling. The first level is pass loss. Uh, the first level is pass loss which is a power loss over distance. There are three methods in this. First is uh, propagation pass loss. Uh, that is uh, a free space propagation pass loss, which models the case when there is only line of sight. The second method is ground reflection to ray uh, pass loss model, which uh, models the case where you have a line of sight and you, you also have a reflected link. And then the third method is hard as uh, urban uh, pass loss model, which model which is uh, approximated by uh, measurement. And then shadowing fading, uh, the second level is shadowing effect, which is also called shadowing fading. It is modeled by low normal distribution. And uh, a shadowing effect is the sudden shortage uh, Sh sh sudden uh, signal power blockage uh, caused by buildings or any obstacles in the environment. The third level is uh, small scale fast fading, uh, which is which happens because of uh, multi pass effect. You have many copies of uh, reflected signals, and they all arrive as a, uh, with different delays and with different uh, phase rotations. So, uh, um, so fast fading uh, not only models the fading amplitude, but also phase rotations. Um, so we normally represent fast fading by a complex value. Uh, the real part and the imaginary part, they are both Gaussian distributed variables. Um, when there is long sight, the mean value of the Gaussian distribution is not zero. When there is, there is no line of sight, it become really fading. So the mean value is zero. Um, uh, 
Let's see. In the morning, we talked about fast fading,、uh, which is caused by a gamma multiplier effect,、um, and、uh, we have learned Doppler effect, which changes the f-、uh, frequency or the wave wavelength of the signal.、Um, so when there is only one、uh, line of sight, Doppler effect would、uh, change the frequency. Of that signal, however, when there are many multipaths, Doppler effect would uh, disperse uh, the signal in the frequency domain. So we have we we can see a、uh, frequency、uh, spectrum broadening. That originally, if you only have one frequency component, I see only、uh, there is only power at this specific. Uh, frequency component, but now with Doppler,、uh, with Doppler effect, we have FC. We have a we have a spectrum power spectral effect,、uh, density function of a U shape <coughs> low pass filter like <coughs> U shape, where you have signal power between FC plus FM and FC minus FM. And then outside this range, the power is zero.、Um, so I have learned that for、uh, because of Doppler effect,、uh, the fading can fluctuate either smoothly or rapidly, depending on you、uh, the moving speed or the velocity of the mobile station.、Um, And、then the third thing I want to emphasize before we move on is、uh, is this. So fading would fluctuate in both time domain and frequency domain. And if、uh, in、uh, frequency domain, fading fluctuates something like this. And we define a coherent bandwidth, which is a range of frequencies over which、uh, the fading is considered constant.、Uh, so if the signal's bandwidth is smaller than this, the case is benign. It is called flat fading or frequency non-selective fading, because we have enough bandwidth here for us to pass the signal through. However, if we have a Very wide signal bandwidth, we will get more data rate.、Uh, this is preferred, but in this case,、uh, over this frequency,、uh, over this uh, uh, signal bandwidth, the fading wouldn't、uh, remain constant. So we have a wide band、uh, system. The fading is called frequency selective fading. So this problem here is called frequency selectivity. Similarly, in time domain, if the fading fluctuates,、uh, something like this, and then we define over a short period of time, fading is、uh, relatively constant. This is a coherent time. So if the signal、uh, duration, symbol duration,、uh, is、uh, smaller than coherent time. This is a benign、uh, scenario, where you、uh, doing the signal transmission, the fading doesn't change, so that's that's good for us. However, if、uh, the symbol duration is、uh, longer, then the fading become like time varying, so it's called time selectivity. So this channel, this fading would be、um, time selective fading. So, yes.、Yeah, so、although we we、uh, talk about a lot of concepts、uh, in the morning,、uh, they can all all of them can be put into different categories. And by putting them into categories, if you are given a piece of paper, you can write down like a bullet point of、uh, concepts and why they are different, how they are different compared to each other. It would help you to understand and also to remember. Uh, those definitions.
Right, uh, so we are uh, moving on to modulation. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, send me an email. I'm more than happy to uh, answer them. Uh, if I have time during the, uh, for uh, during the sessions, I will also highlight some questions uh, that have been asked by email. Um, but you don't hesitate to ask me anything. Uh, there is uh, no stupid question. I I don't I don't always have answer, and I sometimes uh, make mistakes as well. But uh, any any way I can help you to understand better, uh, I'm willing to help. Um, but either way, it's really important at the end of the day. Uh, it's really important to stick to the slides so that you um, do well at the exams. So in the morning we are. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, mod uh, setting quam modulation and demodulation by using the supporting document. Um, so, uh, so that would be, I think that would be a revision for you because I, I think you have learned this uh, in the first year and second year. Uh, this figure, uh, this block diagram is very important. So it's very important for you to, to be able to uh, understand every block I understand uh, what does every block do. Um, so there are some uh, descriptions here um, for the block diagram. We have covered some in the morning. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think I have covered them in the morning. So it's very important that you uh, you understand the block block diagram. You can you can repeat them. You know each function of the block diagram. So we need to uh, move on a little bit. Um, so also and also uh, in doing lectures, I will sometimes tell you that some figures are probably not as important as, for example, uh, this 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 block diagram is very important. So I emphasize quite a lot. And uh, how, for example, how Doppler frequency uh, effect, uh, what is Doppler effect? That is really really important. Uh, there is a figure for Doppler effect. That's also very important. Um, there are some block diagrams in the, in the slides. They provide you some extra knowledge, but they are not as, as important as uh, this key knowledge. Um, I will tell you as we go. Um, so it's important that you also listen to your lecture recording if you are not here uh, during the live lecture. Um, Otherwise, uh, um, it would uh, give you a harder time doing revision because you will know which part is more important than the others. Okay, so uh, come back to here. Um, so all the signal processing before here, they are baseband signal processing. And then after this modulation, the signals up sampled to a uh, carrier frequency. So it become as this is baseband, and then the signal um, is uh, modulated onto the higher frequency. Um, so sometimes it's difficult to uh, modulate to higher frequency just in one step. Uh, signal processing at higher frequency is always very costly. It's always very difficult. Um, it costs it costs more money. To invest those uh, hardwares, and it 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 often, for example, for power amplifier, it often would uh, cause more power dissipation. Um, so sometimes we we introduce uh, intermediate intermediate frequency. So we do some signal signal processing uh, at uh, intermediate frequency first, and then modulate up to uh, uh, the RF carrier frequency. Um, so this is uh, a little bit extra knowledge. Um, it's not as important as uh, QM uh, modulation, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's important that you you know that uh, some sometimes signal processing is like this. And here, um, so we did talk about uh, we did talk about low pass filter here. Low pass filter we normally use root uh, raised cosine filter and uh, for this linear low pass filter so this is uh, a 
of the spectrum of uh, root raised cosine filter. Um, so the bandwidth is controlled by rollout factor. This is a rollout factor. So the filter can be either, um, so the spectrum can be either cut off quite sharply or it can roll out quite smoothly. So the more sharp the spectrum is cut off, the more expensive and the more capacity the filter design is. Um, however, you, you will have a smaller bandwidth uh, occupation for the signal transmission for this one. So after you modulate it onto FC, which is a center frequency, the signal bandwidth will be FC minus FS over two. Uh, over uh, and, and uh, to FC plus FS over two. So the range is smaller. However, if the rollout factor is smaller, it's, uh, it's easier to design, but uh, the bandwidth occup uh, occup occup occupation would be, would be larger. So, uh, so there are pros and cons. Uh, this would uh, introduce interference to other users. So that's the rollout factor for um, the linear filter. Um, this one here is also a little bit extra knowledge that we the root um, rest cosine filter is a linear filter, and sometimes we can do a nonlinear filter that can uh, do phase shaping directly according to the digital signal. So we don't need um, we need don't need to concern too much about uh, um, post generation and and low pass filter post shaping. This is a non-linear filter. But nowadays we normally use linear filter. So this is uh, um, just a little bit extra knowledge. And then here once again is uh, about the intermediate frequency which we have introduced before. So this is not as important as uh, the quant modulation itself. But it's important to know there is an intermediate frequency. Uh, signal processing can be conducted at the intermediate frequency there, um, and, then, and then jump to uh, RF frequency. So uh, modulation. Uh, we are, I assume we are familiar with uh, this system quant. Uh, constellation diagram is also called square sitting quam because the pattern is like uh, like a square. Uh, it's perfectly symmetric and uh, it's perfectly square. Um, so the mapping here, uh, the bit to symbol mapping um, is uh, gray mapping, which means for every pair of neighboring constellation points, there is only one bit different. So when you receive a signal, and if it cross um, a decision boundary, then you only have one bit arrow. Uh, that's a benefit. So uh, gray mapping help you to achieve uh, a small number of arrows as possible. We are going to learn a little bit more about uh, constellation design by studying another constellation. Uh, so we are going to do some uh, very simple maths based on this, very, very simple maths. Um, but uh, they are very important. It's very important that, that you can, you, you'll be able to repeat them. Um, so if I haven't made, made it clear uh, during this process, uh, do let me know. Uh, uh, raise your hand or send a message or something. So when we have a, a constellation like this, this is called star uh, system quam. So we still have uh, 16 constellation points, but uh, but now we have two circles. Each circle has six constellation points that are equal spaced. So each uh, for each circle, there is uh, the mapping is like eight PSK.
So mapping for 8 PSK, I will take 3 bits. In Quam, we have 4 bits. So the other bit determines whether the consolidation point is in the inner circle or the outer circle. Um, so the mapping is not provided in here, so you are not required to do that. But uh, this is uh, this is how we um, how we map the signal anyway. And uh, let's uh, look at the objective when we when we design a constellation. The first objective is the minimum Euclidean distance. So the minimum distance between these constellation points. So we can see that the minimum distance between consolidation points in the inner circle is D1. And then the minimum distance between the two consolidation points across different circles is D2. There will be a trade-off between D1 and D2. So if you want to increase D1, you need to uh, uh, kind of uh, span the first circle so the first circle is like this. If the first circle is uh, spending a little bit uh, more, then the distance between the consolidation points would be enlarged. However, in that case, D2 will be decreased. And if you want to increase D2, you need to shrink the first circle. But in that case, D1 is decreased. So that's something we need to uh, consider carefully when we design the constellation. So the first uh, objective is the minimum Euclidean distance that provide us immunity against noise. And then the second objective is uh, minimum phase rotation. So for this constellation, the minimum phase rotation between consolidation points is this angle. Um, so this uh, phase rotation would give, up, give us immunity against, against phase, phase jitter. So we also want this to be as, as large as possible. The third objective is called peak to average uh, phasor energy ratio. We nowadays we often call it peak to average power ratio. Um, so for this consolidation, the so peak, uh, who can tell me what the peak value is? Peak power. I just want to make sure that uh, you are all awake. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Thank you. So the peak uh, power is uh, A2 square. And what is the average? So the average is A1 square. And uh, A2 square. divided by two. So this is a peak to average power ratio. Peak to power average uh, peak to, uh, sorry, peak to average power ratio is very important for power amplifier. So for a power amplifier, you have um, a voltage in, so input voltage. And then you have a voltage out. You have V in and V out. And then in order to be able to faithfully amplify the digital signal, we need a linear uh, curve that provides linear amplification for all of these values. So if the P to peak to average power ratio is very large, we need to maintain a very large peak to, uh, linear region. So if the PAPR peak to average power ratio is large, we need to maintain a very large linear uh, region. 
that is expensive and it costs a lot of power. So we want to reduce it so that we only need to maintain a smaller area of linear region. So uh, for all the commercially available power amplifier in the market, um, most of them have a power efficiency lower than 40%. 40% is really low actually, because this is really bad because 50% of the power is dissipated as heat. So sometimes you, you, you may even feel your mobile phone is uh, kind of warm, it's kind of heated because a lot of, uh, a lot of heat uh, that's provided to the circuit has been dissipated as heat. It is especially detrimental for the base station because base, base station has so many circuits. It also has to employ like cooling device to cool down the temperature. So it's not green, it costs a lot of power. And uh, um, so we, we want to keep uh, a uh, peak to average power ratio as low as possible so that we don't need to maintain a very large linear region. So the important takeaway here is for your Clinton distance, the larger the better. For phase rotation, the larger the better. However, for peak to average uh, phase energy ratio, the smaller the better. Uh, so we are going to we are going to calculate each one of them for this new constellation. Uh, first of all, let me emphasize uh, some um, metrics on this uh, figure so that we will be able to see them, um, remember them when we cannot see this figure in the later slides. So we are going to focus on, on this triangle. Uh, it is A1. On this side, it is A1. It is also A1 on the other side. And then the length of this side is uh, D1. The angle here is 45 degree. because all the constellation points they are equal spaced. And then another re relationship is uh, uh, A2. Then there is A1 equals D2. Okay. So let's take a look at the very simple mass we, we've got here. So we are going to focus on this uh, triangle. There are two constellation points at here. The so angle is 45 degree. Uh, on both sides, the lens is A1. On the opposite side, the lens is D1. So if, if we want to establish the, the re relationship between A1 and D1, what we need to do is we split this angle, and then which is uh, orthogonal, which is orthogonal to the opposite side. Because the two sides they are of the same lines, so the angle, these two angles are 67.5 degree. And then we've, what we've got is uh, um, A1 times cosine this equals to D1 by 2. So we get this. And then the second step is uh, we, as I said before, D, there is trade-off between D1 and D2. So the most simple way 
is to uh, make them equal to each other so that we don't make a mess later on. So D1 equals D2, and we said A2 minus A1 equals D2. Um, so all of them are linked uh, together now. Um, there is another metric, uh, which is a uh, rain ratio. So we have two rains. Rain ratio is A2 divided by A1. So based on this uh, equation, we can get uh, the rain, what, what is the value for rain ratio, which is uh, this one here. And normally, uh, in simulations, rain ratio within this range would have similar uh, BR performance. So, so that's what happens in simulation. So the three metric we are going we 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 find it very important is uh, the phase rotation, the minimum uh, Euclidean distance, and the peak to average uh, phase energy ratio. So we know the phases are equal spaced. So the f uh, minimum phase is 45 degree, and then we need to calculate minimum distance. How do we do that? Because first of all, we have already linked uh, A1, A2 with uh, D1, D2 here. And secondly, remember that we have two rings, and each ring has eight constellation points. For the first ring, uh, all the constellation points has a power of A1 square. And for the outer, outer ring, every constellation point has a power of A2 square. So if we add all the power together and then take the average, this is the average energy. So this is the average energy as a function of A1 and A2. If we define D, uh, D1 equals D2 equals D, and because we have linked A1, A2 with D here, we can put them in here, uh, in here, so that we, what we get is uh, uh, E0 here, E0, so average energy as a function of uh, D. This D is minimum distance between constellation points because the minimum distance is D1, D2, they are equal to each other. So the minimum distance we can represent it as a function of energy now. Normally, for example, if normally energy is one, then this part is ignored. This is the minimum distance. But often we, we keep E0 here because we can adjust it. So this is a minimum distance. Peak to average power ratio, uh, we said before, peak is A1 square, uh, sorry, A2 square. And then average is uh, average of A1 square and A2 square. We have linked A1 and A2 to D before. So if I put uh, those relationship into uh, this equation, we get a peak to average um, power ratio, which is this value. This is for star quantum. So next, we are going to calculate exactly the same set of metrics for square quantum. So the minimum phase is the phase of uh, this one here. It is calculated by this. And then the, for the minimum Euclidean distance, you can see that the minimum distance between constellation points is 2D, so D here, and then D here, D here, and D here. Uh, so it's 2D. Um, so, uh, okay, um, so for square quantum, there are actually three rings. So first ring contains four constellation points, which are the constellation points associated with I'm um, sorry, hold on. So there are f f uh, three rings. 
first rain contain four consolidation points, which are consolidation points associated with a uh, real part of magnitude is D, and imaginary part of magnitude of uh, D. So there are four points. The second circle contains eight points, which has a consolidation associated with uh, either real part uh, of magnitude 3D and then imaginary part of uh, D, sorry. This is a real part of magnitude D and then, and then imaginary part of magnitude 3D or the other way around, the real part of magnitude 3D, imaginary part of magnitude of D. So all of these eight uh, consolidation points have the same power. And then the third circle contains uh, four consolidation points, which are the consolidation points associated with a uh, real part of uh, magnitude of 3D and the imaginary part of magnitude 3D, regardless, regardless of sign. So if we calculate the average energy, we have four constellation points of the first circle, eight constellation points of the second circle, and then four constellation points of the, the, the outer circle. And now we take average we get the relationship between the energy and the distance. The minimum distance is 2D. So the minimum distance is this one. And then peak to average power ratio is, uh, peak is uh, power of the outer ring. And then average is this one. So peak is uh, the biggest power here, 18 d square, and the average is the average 10 d square, and then we get this uh, average uh, power. Uh, sorry, uh, this uh, peak to average power ratio. So this table is very important. You should be able to uh, um, calculate this uh, by yourself and then fill the table. So now, uh, can anyone tell me, in terms of phase rotation, which one is better, star or square? Any guesses? Yes, that's correct. So for phase rotation, the higher phase, the better. It gives us more immunity against phase jitters. And then in terms of uh, a minimum Euclidean distance, uh, which one is better, uh, star or square? Anyone? I assume, y yes, yes, square. So this one is uh, better because it gives us more immunity against noise. How about peak to average power ratio, which one is better? This is very important. So it's very important that you answer me. <laughs> yes, that's correct, thank you. So we said before, the lower peak to average uh, phasor energy ratio is the smaller uh, the linear uh, range we need to maintain for the power amplifier. So linear range for power amplifier. So uh, the higher the better for phase rotation, the higher the better for minimum Euclidean distance, um, but uh, the smaller the better for peak to average uh, phasor energy ratio. I hope, uh, I hope that's, uh, that's clear. So now we're going to talk about decision theory. So after designing the consolidation, now all we need to do is uh, to decide how to detect them as a receiver. So the, the whole detection theory or decision theory 
is based on Bayes' theorem, which tells us through the relationship between conditional probabilities. So, um, if we have a deck of cards, uh, 52 cards, uh, taking off all the jokers, uh, we have 50, 52 cards, and then we have four aces, right? We have four aces. What is the probability of if when you take one card from that deck, what is the probability of uh, getting an uh, aces? It's very simple. It's four by fifty-two. And now, after you're taking out the first card, uh, you now you take another card. What is the chance that uh, the card is another aces? The probability would be three divided by fifty-one. So the con conditional probability here is first you take one aces from the deck of cards. The probability here is four by fifty-two. And then on the condition that you you have already taken one card, the probability that the second card is also as aces. Uh, that probability is three divided by fifty-one, so the probability would uh, would change. That's the importance of Bayes' theorem. So what does it tell us uh, for detection? Um, so suppose we have a uh, received signal model. So this is what we uh, y is what we received, and x is what we transmitted. Suppose there is no fading, there is only noise. So basically, what we want to what we want to know is here we uh we want to decide with given y, what is the probability of x n is transmitted. For example, if it's a BPSK consolidation, uh, we have already uh we have received a signal at this position. What is the probability that uh, signal one was transmitted, and what is the probability that signal minus one is transmitted? So based based on this, a guess would be maybe 0 0.6 probability that one is transmitted, and 0 0.4 probability that this is transmitted, and then. Because this one is bigger, so as a receiver, we can decide that uh, it was one that was transmitted. So this is the probability that we want to know, we want to infer. We, we are given, we have received y, what is the probability that um, xn is transmitted? However, it's, it's, it's not straightforward to calculate, so we need Bayes theorem. Uh, on the right hand side, this probability is called a priori, a priori probability here, a priori probability. So normally it is a uh, constant. Um, so the probability of transmitting one or transmitting minus one, there is a half half chance. So we ever transmit one or, or transmit minus one. So normally for BPSK, uh, as a transmitter side, the a priori probability is 0 0.5 for both of them. So this is a kind of like a constant. If it's a constant, we can ignore because uh, in the end, we, on, we, we need to compare the difference. And then the dominator here, Py, is the PDI of the received signal, which is also a constant. We can ex uh, extend uh, Py uh, by this. So this is uh, the summation of all the probabilities. So for each individual probability uh, in this equation, Py is a constant. So these two are constant. What about this probability? So if we have a, a received signal model of y equals x plus noise, Uh, this probability is the probability that we transmit x, but then we received y. So 
uh, the only thing that has done something is the noise. So this conditional probability is exactly the uh, distribution of the noise, so the PDF of the noise. So we're going to talk about this one. This is really, really important. It looks a little bit uh, messy, but let's approach it, approach this step by step. First step, if we have uh, BPSK consolidation, uh, plus one and the minus one, can anyone tell me where the decision boundary is? So plus one, minus one, where is the decision boundary? The decision boundary is zero. Sorry, we, uh, we are a little bit running out of time. Um, so the decision boundary is zero. So as a receiver, if you receive a signal on the right-hand side, it's more likely that one was transmitted. Um, if you receive a signal on the left-hand side, then it's more likely minus one was transmitted. And then the second question, the second step is, what is the distribution of the noise? The distribution of the noise is Gaussian distributed with uh, zero mean and the variance that determines the, 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 the whites of the PDF. So now if we receive a signal at this point, how can we decide the probability that uh, this signal was transmitted but we received this, uh, this signal? So what we do is we place the PDF uh, centered at the, the signal that was in the conditional probability. So we transmitted this, but we re received this. The probability we can directly read from the PDF because it's only the noise that gives us the probability estimation why a signal position moved from, he from here to here. And then we get this conditional probability. So for this example, um, maybe this probability would be 0 0.6 because it's on the right-hand side. It's closer to, uh, to 1. And then we also need another probability here. So if we receive a signal at this point, what is the probability of transmitting this signal? So what's the probability that this signal was a signal that was transmitted? We place the Gaussian PDF uh, centered here. And PDFs, P, sorry, PDF, they all, always have long tails. So if the tail spans over the decision boundary, we can read that the probability of receiving this is from this tail. So in this way, um, for this example, we can roughly say the probability here can read something like 0 0.4. Okay, and in comparison, this is higher, so maybe this was transmitted. And then we have all this uh, PDF plotted. Uh, so so originally, originally for the noise PDF, there's zero mean, but here we shift to uh, the PDF, so that the mean become the transmitted signal. Um, so can anyone tell me uh, how to calculate error probability? We are running out of time, so I'm ju just going to answer. So when the PDF uh, cross the decision boundary, there will be an error. So the probability of having error is uh, the area under the PDF that cross the decision boundary. I hope I hope that's clear. So when you when you look at this figure again, just just think step by step, all the way from the constellation of BPSK and how to decide on decision boundary, and what is the PDF that we know, and how to project that PDF onto this uh, decision. And uh, so this is a PDF 
And so why uh, minus x is a noise? So, so, so this is a PDF of the noise. But we kind of uh, shift the PDF to x1 or x2, which is 1 or minus 1. The decision boundary is a middle point between 1 and the minus 1. So decision boundary is 0. And then, um, so for the for the error probability, it is a probability of transmitting x1. So x1 is minus 1, and then x2 is, uh, is a positive. So the probability of transmitting x1, but which receive a positive receive signal, that is an error. Or we transmit a positive signal, but then we receive a negative signal, that is an error. So remember I said there's a half-half chance uh, whether this one is transmitted or this one is transmitted, so there is it's 0 0.5. And the situation is asymmetric, remember. So this conditional probability equals to this conditional probability. So in the end, we only need to analyze one conditional probability. So what we do here is we need to integral the PDF. And uh, um, so integral on a Gaussian PDF, because we, we do it quite a lot in communications, uh, there is no closed form. Uh, so what we do is we define a Q function, which is convenient for engineer for engineer to use. So if you search Q function in MATLAB, it's already built in. So Q function is integral on Gaussian PDF. It is uh, defined here. So integral on Gaussian PDF. So Q function kind of look, look like this. So if you have a Gaussian PDF, if, if you integ integrate from a smaller value, so PDF is here, if you integral, integrate from minus three here, then the area would be uh, almost equal to one. And then later on, if you integrate uh, from a later, later higher value, then the area becomes smaller, so it kind of drop. So, uh, so error probability is the integral of uh, error probability of BPSK is integral of that Gaussian uh, PDF. So, so by using Q function, we can plot this BR performance. So this is actually why um, communication systems are highly modeled because we, we don't need to run any simulations. We don't need to take any experiments anymore. We only need to know the distribution of the noise, which is Gaussian distributed. Then we know its performance, what its performance is like. This is very important for system design because for example, if we have a target BR of 10 to minus five, we know how much SNR we require for the system. So that's, uh, that's what BR performance is about. So I'm going to finish here. Uh, sorry for running a little bit fast later on. If, if you don't understand, if there's anything you don't understand, send me an email. Um, so, so yeah, that's all from today. Um, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you.